THE WHITE COMPANY by Sir Arthur Conan Doyle CHAPTER Seventeen: HOW THE YELLOW COG CROSSED THE BAR OF Gironde. For two days the yellow cog ran swiftly before a northeasterly wind, and on the dawn of the third the high land of Ushant lay like a mist upon the shimmering skyline. There came a plump of rain towards midday, and the breeze died down, but it freshened again before nightfall, and Goodwin Hortain veered his sheet and held head for the south. Next morning they had passed Belle Isle, and ran through the midst of a fleet of transports returning from Guienne. Sir Nigel Loring and Sir Oliver Buttsthorn at once hung their shields over the side, and displayed their pennants as was the custom, noting with the keenest interest the answering symbols which told the names of the cavaliers who had been constrained by ill health or wounds to leave the prince at so critical a time. That evening a great dun-coloured cloud banked up in the west, and an anxious man was Goodwin Hortain, for a third part of his crew had been slain, and half the remainder were aboard the galleys, so that with an injured ship he was little fit to meet such a storm as sweeps over those waters. All night it blew in short fitful puffs, heeling the great cog over until the water curled over her lee bulwarks. As the wind still freshened, the yard was lowered halfway down the mast in the morning. Alan, wretchedly ill and weak, with his head still ringing from the blow which he had received, crawled up upon deck. Water swept and aslant, it was preferable to the noisome, rat-haunted dungeons which served as cabins. There, clinging to the stout halyards of the sheet, he gazed with amazement at the long lines of black waves, each with its curling ridge of foam, racing in endless succession from out of the inexhaustible west. A huge, sombre cloud, flecked with livid blotches, stretched over the whole seaward skyline, with long, ragged streamers whirled out in front of it. Far behind them the two galleys laboured heavily, now sinking between the rollers until their yards were level with the waves, and again shooting up with a reeling, scooping motion, until every spar and rope stood out hard against the sky. On the left the low-lying land stretched in a dim haze, rising here and there into a darker blur which marked the higher capes and headlands. The land of France! Alan's eyes shone as he gazed upon it. The land of France, the very words sounded as the call of a bugle in the ears of the youth of England. The land where their fathers had bled, the home of chivalry and of knightly deeds, the country of gallant men, of courtly women, of princely buildings, of the wise, the polished, and the sainted. There it lay, so still and grey beneath the drifting rack, the home of things noble and of things shameful, the theatre where a new name might be made, or an old one marred. From his bosom to his lips came the crumpled veil, and he breathed a vow that if valour and good will could raise him to his lady's side, then death alone should hold him back from her. His thoughts were still in the woods of Minstead and the old armoury of Twynham Castle, when the hoarse voice of the master shipman brought them back once more to the Bay of Biscay. "'By my troth, young sir,' he said, "'you are as long in the face as the devil at a christening.' "'And I cannot marvel at it, for I have sailed these waters since I was as high as this winyard, and yet I never saw a more sure promise of an evil night.' Uh, "'Nay, I had other things upon my mind,' the squire answered. "'And so has every man,' cried Hortain, in an injured voice. "'Let the shipmen see to it. It's the master shipman's affair.' "'Put it all on good master Hortain. Never had I so much care since first I blew trumpet and showed cartel at the west gate of Southampton.' "'What is amiss, then?' asked Alan, for the man's words were as gusty as the weather. "'Amiss, quotha! Here am I with but half my mariners, and a hole in the ship where that twenty devil stone struck us big enough to fit the fat widow of Northam through. It is well enough on this tack, but I would have you tell me what I am to do on the other. We are like to have salt water upon us until we be found pickled like the herrings in an Easterling's barrels. "'What says Sir Nigel to it?' He is below, pricking out the coat armour of his mother's uncle. Pester me not with such small matters. It was all that I could get from him. Then there's Sir Oliver. Fry them in oil with a dressing of Gascony, quoth he, and then swore at me, because I had not been the cook. Walla-wa, thought I. 
"'Mad master, sober man. "'So away forward to the archers. "'Harrow and alas, but they are worse than the others. "'Would they not help you, then? "'Nay, they sat twa and twa at a board. "'Him that they call Aylward, "'and the great red-headed man who snapped the Norman's arm-bone, "'and the black man from Norwich, and a score of others, "'rattling their dice in an archer's gauntlet for want of a box. "'The ship can scarce last much longer, my masters,' quoth I. "'That's your business, old swineserd,' cried the black galliot. "'The diable Tom Port,' says Elwood. "'A five, a four, and the main,' shouted the big man, with a voice like the flap of a sail. "'Hark to them now, young sir, and say if I speak not sooth.' As he spoke, there sounded high above the shriek of the gale and the straining of the timbers, a gust of oaths with a roar of deep-chested mirth from the gamblers in the forecastle. "'Can I be of avail?' asked Alan. "'Say the word, and the thing is done, if two hands may do it.' "'Nay, nay.' Your head, I can see, is still totty, and, if faith, little head would you have, had your bassinet not stood your friend. All that may be done is already carried out, for we have stuffed the gate with sails, and corded it without and within. Yet, when we bail our bowlin and veer the sheet, our lives will hang upon the breach remaining blocked. See how yonder headland looms upon us through the mist. We must tack within three arrow flights, or we may find a rock through our timbers. "'Now, St. Christopher, be praised. Here is Sir Nigel, with whom I may confer.' "'I prithee that you will pardon me,' said the knight, clutching his way along the bulwark. "'I would uh, I would not show lack of courtesy towards a worthy man, but I was deep in a matter of some weight. Concerning which, Alan, I should be glad of your read. It touches the question of dimidation and impalement in the coat of mine uncle, Sir John Leighton of Shropshire, who took unto wife the widow of Sir Henry Oglander of Nunwell. The case has been much debated by pursuivants and kings of arms. But how is it with you, Master Shipman? Ill enough, my fair lord. The cog must go about anon, and I know not how we may keep the water out of her. Go call Sir Oliver, said Sir Nigel. And presently the portly knight made his way all astraddle down the slippery deck. By my soul, Master Shipman, this passes all patience, he cried wrathfully. If this ship of yours must needs dance and skip like a clown at a commiss, then I pray you that you will put me into one of the galleasses. I had but sat down to a flask of malvasy and a mortress of brawn, as is my use about this hour, when there comes a jerking, and I find my wine over my legs, and the flask in my lap. And then, as I stoop to clip it, there comes another cursed jerk, and there's a mortress of brawn stuck fast to the nape of my neck. At this moment I have two pages coursing after it from side to side, like hounds behind a leveret. Never did living pig gamble more lightly. But you sent for me, Sir Nigel. I would fain have your read, Sir Oliver, for Master Hortain hath fears that when we veer they may come danger from the hole in our side. Oh, then do not veer, quoth Sir Oliver hastily. And now, fair sir, I must hasten back to see how my rogues have fared with the brawn. Nay, but this will scarce suffice, cried the shipman. If we do not veer, we will be upon the rocks within the hour. Then veer, said Sir Oliver. There is my reed. And now, Sir Nigel, I must crave at this instant, however. A startled shout rang out from the two shipmen upon the forecastle. Rocks, they yelled, stabbing into the air with their four fingers. Rocks beneath our very bows. Through the belly of a great black wave, not one hundred paces to the front of them, there thrust forth a huge, jagged mass of brown stone, which spouted spray as though it were some crouching monster, while a dull, menacing boom and roar filled the air. "'Yeah! Yeah!' screamed Goodwin Hortain, flinging himself upon the long pole which served as a tiller. "'Cut the halyard! Haul her over! Lay her two courses to the wind!' Over swung the great boom, and the cog trembled and quivered within five spear-lengths of the breakers. "'She can scarce draw clear,' cried Hortain, with his eyes from the sail to the seething line of foam. "'May the holy Julian stand by us, and the thrice-sainted Christopher!' "'If there be such peril, Sir Oliver,' quoth Sir Nigel, "'it would be very knightly and fitting that we should show our pennons. "'I pray you, Edrickson, that you will command my guidon-bearer to put forward my banner.' "'And sound the trumpets,' cried Sir Oliver. "'In manus tuus domine, I am in the keeping of James of Compostella.' to whose shrine I shall make pilgrimage, and in whose honour I vow that I will eat a carp each year upon his feast-day. Mon Dieu! But the waves roar! How is it with us now, Master Shipman? 
"'We draw! We draw!' cried Hortain, with his eyes still fixed upon the foam, which hissed under the very bulge of the side. Oh, "'Holy Mother, be with us now!' As he spoke, the cog rasped along the edge of the reef, and a long, white, curling sheet of wood was planed off from her side, from waist to poop, by a jutting horn of the rock. At the same instant she lay suddenly over, and the sail drew full, and she plunged seawards amid the shoutings of the seamen and the archers. "'Virgin be praised!' cried the shipman, wiping his brow. "'For this shall bell swing and candle burn when I see Southampton water once more. "'Cheerily, my hearts, pull yearly on the bowline. "'By my soul, I would rather have a dry death,' quoth Sir Oliver. "'Though, mon Dieu, I have eaten so many fish that it were but justice that the fish should eat me.' Now I must back to the cabin, for I have matters there which crave my attention. Nay, Sir Oliver, you had best bide with us, and still show your ensign, Sir Nigel answered. For if I understand the matter aright, we have but turned from one danger to the other. Good Master Hortain, cried the boatswain, rushing aft, the water comes in upon us apace. The waves have driven in the sail wherewith we strove to stop the hole. As he spoke, the seamen came swarming on to the poop and the forecastle to avoid the torrent which poured through the huge leak in the waist. High above the roar of the wind and the clash of the sea rose the shrill, half-human cries of the horses as they found the water rising rapidly around them. "'Stop it from without!' cried Hortain, seizing the end of the wet sail, with which the gap had been plugged. "'Speedily, my hearts, we're gone!' Swiftly they rove ropes to the corners, and then, rushing forward to the bows, they lowered them under the keel, and drew them tight in such a way that the sail should cover the outer face of the gap. The force of the rush of water was checked by this obstacle, but it still squirted plentifully from every side of it. At the sides the horses were above the belly, and in the centre a man from the poop could scarce touch the deck with a seven-foot spear. The cog lay lower in the water, and the waves splashed freely over the weather bulwark. "'I fear we can scarce bide upon this tack,' cried Hortain. "'And yet the other will drive us on the rocks.' "'Might we not haul down sail and wait for better times?' suggested Sir Nigel. "'Nay, we should drift upon the rocks. Thirty years have I been on the sea, and never yet in greater straits. "'Yet we are in the hands of the saints.' "'Of whom?' cried Sir Oliver. "'I look more particularly to St. James of Compostella.' who hath already befriended us this day, and on whose feast I hereby vow that I shall eat a second carp, if he will but interpose a second time. The rack had thickened seaward, and the coast was but a blurred line. Two vague shadows in the offing showed where the galleasses rolled and tossed upon the great Atlantic rollers. Hortain looked wistfully in their direction. If they would but lie closer, we might find safety, even should the cog founder. You will bear me out with good Master Witherton of Southampton, that I have done all that a shipman might. It would be well that you should doff Camel and grieve, Sir Nigel, for by the black rood it is like enough that we shall have to swim for it. Nay, said the little knight, it would scarce be fitting that a cavalier should throw off his harness for the fear of every puff of wind and puddle of water. I would rather that my company should gather round me here on the poop, where we might abide together, whatever God may be pleased to send. Certes, Master Hortain, for all that my sight is none of the best, it is not the first time that I have seen that headland upon the left. The seaman shaded his eyes with his hand, and gazed earnestly through the haze and spray. Suddenly he threw up his arms and shouted aloud in his joy. "'Tis the point of La Tremblade!' he cried. "'I had not thought that we were as far as Oleron. The Gironde lies before us, and once over the bar and under the shelter of the Tour de Coudon, all will be well with us. Veer again, my hearts, and bring her to try with the main course. The sail swung round once more, and the cog, battered and torn and well-nigh waterlogged, staggered in for this haven of refuge. A bluff cape to the north and a long spit to the south marked the mouth of the noble river, with a low-lying island of silted sand in the centre, all shrouded and curtained by the spume of the breakers. A line of broken water traced the dangerous bar, which in clear day and balmy weather has cracked the back of many a tall ship. "'There is a channel,' said Hortain, "'which was shown to me by the prince's own pilot. Mark yonder tree upon the bank, and see the tower which rises behind it. If these two be held in line, even as we hold them now, it may be done, though our ship draws two ells more than when she put forth.' "'God speed you, Master Hortain,' cried Sir Oliver. "'Twice have we come scathless out of peril.' and now for the third time i commend me to the blessed james of compostella to whom i vow nay nay old friend 
whispered Sir Nigel. "'You are like to bring a judgment upon us with these vows, which no living man could accomplish. Have I not already heard you vow to eat two carp in one day, and now you would venture upon a third? "'I pray that you will order the company to lie down,' cried Hortain, who had taken the tiller and was gazing ahead with fixed eye. "'In three minutes we shall either be lost or in safety.' Archers and seamen lay flat upon the deck, waiting in stolid silence for whatever fate might come. Hortain bent his weight upon the tiller, and crouched to see under the bellying sail. Sir Oliver and Sir Nigel stood erect, with hands crossed in front of the poop. Down swooped the great cog into the narrow channel, which was the portal to safety. On either bow roared the shallow bar. Right ahead one small lane of black swirling water marked the pilot's course. But true was the eye, and firm the hand which guided. A dull scraping came from beneath. The vessel quivered and shook. At the waist, at the quarter, and behind sounded the grim roaring of the waters, and with a plunge the yellow cog was over the bar, and speeding swiftly up the broad and tranquil estuary of the Gironde. End of chapter 17